Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk organized by Loughborough University Nationalism Network. My name is Olivia Chen, and I'm a PhD student in Loughborough University. Very happy to chair today's talk. The talk will be recorded, so uh, please turn off your camera and keep the microphone off during the talk. Today, we are very delighted to be able to welcome Professor Melissa Aronsik from Rutgers University. Melissa is a professor of media studies in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. She is the co-author with Maria Espinoza of A Strategic Nature, Public Relations and the Politics of Environmentalism, published by Oxford University Press. Winner of the 2023 Roderick P. Hart Outstanding Book Award in Political Communication and the 2022 Outstanding Book Award in Public Relations, Innovation, Development and Educational Achievement, both from the National Communication Association. She's also the author of Branding the Nation, the Global Business of National Identity, published in 2013, and the co-editor of Blowing Up the Brand, Critical Perspectives on Promotional Culture, published in 2010. Today, Melissa is going to give us a talk entitled Branding the Nation in the Era of Climate Crisis, and then we will have some time for Q&A session. The talk will finish in an hour. Now, let me hand it over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Olivia, and thank you to Marco for inviting me and to Lufbra and to, it's such a pleasure to see some old friends that I have not seen um, since I visited Lufbra uh, in person. I think it was, I want to say 2019, but my dates might be wrong. There. So, was it 2019? Okay, very good. <laughs> That's what I thought. So really nice to, to see you all again. Um, and I'm going to share my screen because of my own technical limitations. I can't see you while my screen is being shared. So if you can't hear something that I've said, or if you have a question or you want to interrupt, don't hesitate. Please just speak up because I can't see you. Um, but I'm going to have my slides now in the foreground. So first, I'll just make sure. Um, can everyone see this clearly? It's filling the screen, my, my slides. Yes, thank you, Great. Melissa. Thank you. All right, so um, I, I want to you know, give a special thank you to uh, Marco and to the Lund Group for inviting me because it has really given me a chance to reflect on my original interests in nationalism and national identity and how these interests have evolved over time. In fact, I would say it's not so much that my interests have evolved. I would actually say my personal interest and my, my intellectual interest in nationalism as a container for identity, belonging, and rights has remained steady throughout the 21st century, essentially the time period of, of my research and writing about nationalism. But what has changed is the way that nationalism has manifested in the Western world over this time period, as well as the belief in what nationalism is and what it can do, the public belief, I would say. And one thing that I have had to remind myself of is that this time period is really just a blip in the long history of nationalism. We tend to treat each change that happens to us in our lifetimes as revolutionary, forgetting that the same revolutions have taken place in many other lifetimes. And in fact, from an intellectual and a philosophical perspective, Nationalism is doing just what it has been theorized to do. Um, if we look at Craig Calhoun's uh, slim book, Nationalism, one of my, my cherished um, tomes when it comes to thinking about nationalism, he tells us nationalism comes in manifold forms, some benign and reassuring and others terrifying. Social scientists have sometimes been tempted to try to analyze good nationalism or patriotism and bad nationalism or chauvinism as though they were completely different social phenomena. This makes each hard to understand, however, and obscures their commonalities. Both positive and negative manifestations of national identity and loyalty are shaped by the common discourse of nationalism. So that for me is really a theme that I carry with me. And it reassures me to a small extent because on the one hand, it reminds us that nationalism is a discursive formation, um, a daily plebiscite, as Ernest Renan put it, 
And it always contains the seeds of social solidarity, popular participation, and the shared values and beliefs that are required for democratic expression. On the other hand, um, these words remind me that our historical encounters, um, our extreme antagonistic and anti-democratic nationalisms are not at all uh, in the past. Um, they are recurring phenomena. Um, they are unfortunately, it seems somewhat cyclical. And we ignore the factors that give rise to this end of the spectrum uh, at our peril. Back in the early 2000s, when I first encountered the phenomenon of nation branding, the extreme sort of nationalism that we're seeing today was nowhere on the Western radar. The narrative that gave rise to nation branding was one of integration, marketization, and especially globalization. And this was really the narrative that I explored in, in this book, the cover of which uh, you see here. Um, I mean, I, it was it was critical, but nevertheless, it was um, interested in looking at this relationship between nationalism and globalization. And what I found was that often nationalism and globalism were presented as either or fallacies. You know, there were really only two options, it appeared, and you couldn't have one unless you got rid of the other. These two concepts were also presented as part of a teleology. This was meant to be a narrative of progress by political leaders uh, and economic leaders. And this narrative of progress, you know, we would move from nationalism to globalization by overcoming our provincial and old fashioned um, ideas about national borders and become part of a global citizenry with a cosmopolitan outlook on the world. Needless to say, this way of looking at nationalism was ideologically driven by those powerful economic and political institutions and actors who stood to benefit from porous borders and the free movement of migrants, tourists, and money. To the extent that there was national sentiment in this new, so to speak, new and improved version of looking at nationalism in the early 2000s, it was what the sociologist Leslie Sclair cynically termed global nationalism, the belief that national values remained acceptable as long as they were tied to the global marketplace. And this is where nation branding came in. So in the early 2000s, when I, I first arrived at graduate school, I was just fascinated by this idea that there was this form of communication that was rooted in advertising, marketing, and branding, and that could promote national identity and nationalism in global arenas, from diplomacy to sports contests, uh, to economic forums and tourism. It was really a form of banal nationalism, or perhaps even better, of benign nationalism. You know, for the first time since 1944, Germany was allowed to wave the flag as long as it was draped over the model Claudia Schiffer. <laughs> um, and you see here, these, these images appear in my book from 2013. Um, you know, we could talk about Germany and wave the flag as long as we were in this context of the business climate and investment. Obviously, deregulation was a watchword in this in this day. Uh, it was all about global markets, removing removing barriers to um, the global exchange of capital. Now, of course, this kind of branded nationalism came with a few rules. Um, one could market heritage, but one could not market history. Uh, one of the things I noticed in my my case study uh, on Poland in the book was that. We could talk about Poland as long as we talked about the reconstruction of cities or the beautiful old square in Krakow. But we could not talk about the suffering. We could not talk about the many times that the national borders of Poland had been um, moved and changed as a result of earlier revolutions. Um, this slide I'm showing you now here is a slide from a, an advertising firm called Safran, where they were trying to explain Explore how the older generation was no longer relevant in this new marketized version of national identity. As you see here, they were listing these features of an older generation and saying, you know, that's all in the past. That way of looking at history and memory is no longer relevant. 
Rather, we want to focus on the younger generation, the so-called market economy generation, as they put it. So we had heritage, but not history. We had youth, but not memory. And we have the absence of conflict because we had an absence of heterogeneity. This was really at the heart of nation branding. You had consultants like Wally Owens, pictured here at the bottom uh, with the red jacket, uh, and of course, the infamous Simon Anholt, who created slick ad campaigns, invented charts, and made up rankings with the, what I consider rather absurd idea that you could actually measure the value of a country's brand. Uh, and yet we all kind of, <laughs> many of us really jumped on this, this bandwagon. And instead of seeing this as a liability, we all started to see it as a solution. It became a solution to earlier forms of conflict between nations. And especially I, I saw this uh, being touted as a solution to development uh, issues. Here's one example. This is Simon Anholt pictured here giving a presentation in uh, about the country of Chile. Um, I also heard from many leaders of African nations with the sense that this would be a real panacea uh, for African development. Um, it was seen as a way to overcome separatist factions, whether in Spain or, or in Quebec, um, and to resolve local or regional divides and disputes. Now, of course, the role of the media was really key here. So much of the nation branding project was tied up with what could be seen as media friendly content. And indeed, media organizations were active participants in the creation and circulation of these images. So what we started to see for national identity was a turn toward a particular kind of visibility that would lead to a particular kind of recognition. Again, this new and improved version, this businessified, marketized version of national identity. The teleology of progress through branding was really never more powerful than in these early years, uh, the first decade of the 2000s. That said, you know, now we, we kind of move forward. Of course, the, you know, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 was, was really allowed the cracks to begin to show. You know, this image you see here about Chile is from 2009, but already um, issues were surfacing. Um, and I, I thought this image, uh, Getty image, really um, summarizes it. You know, Spain had been seen as one of the earliest, you know, um, success stories when it came to nation branding. And yet, you know, only a few years later, a very different scenario was presenting itself. And this image actually appears in the conclusion to this first book I wrote on nation branding. And I used the image to try to communicate this sense of unease that was accompanying my thinking by the time I completed my dissertation and, and then the book. Because it seemed to me that after the financial crisis, you know, in this aftermath, were we not being shown the limits of branding, the limits of strategic communication and mediatization to promote national interests? And to my surprise, I really did not see this coming, but I'm a, I'm a terrible um, predictor <laughs> of future events, so maybe that's why I didn't see it coming. Um, what we have seen is really just the opposite. Um, we have seen um, all kinds of so-called resurgences of nationalism. Um, uh, you know, this is an extreme example on the U.S.-Mexico border, what you're seeing here, but, you know, there are so many other extreme examples I, I could have used. Um, Wendy Brown's wonderful book published in 2017, uh, Walled States Waning Sovereignty, strongly alerted me to the ways that national leaders attempt to reassert their power, not by being open to the world, but by closing off their borders. And that here was something that was perhaps qualitatively different, which was that unlike prior nationalist movements or state leadership throughout history, this time what we were seeing was a growing awareness of the reality that global flows of goods and people can also lead to global flows of weapons and pandemics. And that crises or scandals of national resources, anything from the deforestation of the Amazon to auto companies cheating on their vehicle emissions, 
we're fast becoming not just global crises, but planetary crises. In other words, crises of human existence. The media reinforced the idea that what we were starting to see was different. Um, they really pushed the idea, especially around this time, that the antagonistic and conflict-ridden nationalism we saw emerging after the financial crisis was somehow unprecedented. And I really think the media did a disservice uh, here for the general public, because by imagining that we were encountering a new nationalism over the last few years, we were prevented from looking too closely at history to recognize how the seeds of illiberalism, nativism, and racism that helped give rise to many of the current contexts we are seeing had been planted long, long ago. So I mentioned, you know, the title of my talk refers to nation branding in the era of climate crisis. So what has happened to my thinking more recently is to join together these earlier thoughts with this current planetary crisis, uh, something I've, uh, I think like many of us have become increasingly concerned about. So I want to talk now about a particular manifestation of nationalism. And I found it particularly interesting because it uses the same tactics of mediatization and marketing um, that we encountered in the heyday of national branding back in the early 2000s, but it's very much a product of the waning sovereignty that Wendy Brown uh, brought our attention to. And it's also in the context of this phenomenon, so to speak, or this condition is a better word, of uh, climate change. Um, this condition that we are all now, uh, to, to a man, to a woman, forced to live with, forced to live within. Um, I addressed some of the issues in this article. This is, um, I'm so glad Sabina is here. This is part of a special uh, themed section that uh, Sabina, Mihelj, and Cesar, um, oh my gosh, I'm having a, a blank on his last name, um, help me. <laughs> Jimenez Martinez. Thank you. He, Cesar Jimenez Martinez. Sorry, my terrible memory in this day and age. Um, put together um, as a result, actually, as a, a follow up to the 2019 um, visit I made to Loughborough. So I'm really glad for the opportunity to have um, thought through some of these ideas through this article. Um, and so I'm going to talk now just a little bit about some of the ideas, not all of the ideas in, in this article. And I invite you to um, look, take a look at it if you have not already. Um, this is about uh, eco-nationalism, and eco-nationalism is a very complex concept. It's multifaceted. Um, it blend, at its most basic, it blends environmentalism with nationalism, um, and it essentially suggests that the nation state and its citizens have a particular responsibility to protect the environment within their own borders. In principle, eco-nationalism can be a politically left-leaning or a politically right-leaning ideology. On the left might be those who see nationalism as a tool to mobilize people for environmental action um, or as a way to safeguard um, natural heritage, for instance. But the way I have mainly observed it and the way I address it in this article is that it's among really those on the right who have used environmental concerns to justify border closures in the name of resource scarcity. Eco-nationalism seen from this vantage point legitimizes a social imaginary that prioritizes the rights of national citizens to ecological benefits, agricultural benefits, uh, energy benefits, and environmental benefits. And in its most dire manifestations, it involves restricting immigration or limiting resource sharing with other countries. Now, eco-nationalists, as I alluded to earlier, will sometimes deploy the same kind of banal or benign nationalism marketing that we saw earlier with nation branding. So I wanna show you now a one minute commercial that illustrates this 
um, banal nationalism at work. I'm going to um, switch to YouTube and hopefully it will work. <laughs> Can everyone see these cows? Can someone just let me know if you see? Yes, we do. You see? Okay, very good. And if I just start randomly, because I don't want to ruin the thing, but if I just start it, can you hear the it? latest? They're blaming. Can you hear that? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to play it now and then I'll, I'll come back to you uh, as soon as it ends. Heard the latest? They're blaming us for greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, I admit I have some gas issues, but that's utterly ridiculous. None of us drive an SUV. Or live in a McMansion. Or fly on jumbo jets. Hey Bernie, cows ain't the problem. It's people, population growth. Yup, more people, more cars, more electricity, greenhouse gases. And population growth is driven by mass immigration. You don't see any cows crossing the border. How much longer are politicians going to milk this issue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's get to the meat of the matter. Zing. Too many people. And too much hot air about cows. Cows are not the problem, people. It's time to slow mass immigration. Then we can all breathe a little easier. Let's put the cow critics out to pasture. Paid for by Progressives for Immigration Reform. So now I'm coming back to my slides. <laughs> Can everyone see the slide again? Yep. OK, fantastic. So um, that <laughs> there's so many things we could say about that advertisement. Um, if you are me, you watched the first part and thought it was just silly and absurd. And then it took a very quick right turn. Like I absolutely did not anticipate <laughs> the narrative that that ad would end up with. But um, the Progressives for Immigration Reform is just one of many, many groups in the United States and elsewhere that, as you can see, use environmental concerns to promote uh, far right understandings of the nation state and of what is necessary. And um, it's just, again, if, if what, you go onto YouTube, you will see many other examples like this, some more serious and some less serious. But uh, what I think we can just for, for now, what I would like to conclude about that particular ad is just the way that it um, employs a completely benign and even ridiculous, very commercialized idea uh, and public oriented idea of um, what advertising should look like to advance um, these eco nationalist or eco fascist ideas. Um, but unfortunately, um, <laughs> It would, you know, it would be one thing if all we saw were ads such as those, and there are thousands of them. But this kind of messaging does not stop at silly ads uh, featuring cows. Um, in March 2019, um, a white Australian man killed 51 people at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Moments before his attack, he posted a manifesto on the forum 8chan, which is an online forum harboring extremist and white nationalist views. And uh, he, this manifesto was 74 pages long, and those who analyzed it noted the prevalence of memes and inside jokes that were destined for this forum, this 8chan community that's a very tight-knit community. And the manifesto also contained uh, a commentary, part of which you see here on the screen, on the urgency of protecting the natural environment. This was the primary motivation for this killer's deadly intervention, that the natural environment, the land, was the ultimate prize. Um, so I, I won't read what you see here, but you, you can see um, the ideology in the manifesto that's being advanced here. Um, this manifesto was called The Great Replacement. Um, this is a title taken from the French writer Renaud Camus, um, who published, who self-published a book in 2012 called Le Grand Remplacement. 
uh, which advanced the conspiracy that white Christian Europeans are being replaced by invasions of non-white, non-Christian immigrants. And, you know, there's been considerable analysis and um, investigation, of course, into this, this awful um, killing. And as we now know, this killer made extensive use of digital technology to broadcast a very choreographed attack. Uh, he wore a GoPro camera on his head uh, so that he could live stream the massacre via Facebook. And as again, as we all know with Facebook, even if that video is removed, others, uh, usually by the time it's done, others have already copied the video. Uh, so content moderators would move in to remove the video and others had already recorded it and um, edited, edited it on YouTube so that it would escape detection. Um, one popular YouTube personality recorded himself reading the manifesto aloud. Um, which allowed the video to circulate even further. So this manifesto was itself a made-for-media text. It was, in other words, a brand um, circulating as a set of promotional messages, um, however extreme. Um, it even included a mock interview. Um, the killer recorded an interview with himself, like a, a, a two-person interview, but he played both parts. Um, equally as an effort to manage the media narrative. And, you know, if we needed proof of the effective circulation of this manifesto of hatred, we can look to the mass shooting only five months later in El Paso, Texas. Um, most, if not all, of the people killed were uh, Mexican immigrants. And the shooter was a 21-year-old white man claiming the Great Replacement Manifesto as his inspiration. Analysis of influences on the El Paso killer linked to a group called the Pine Tree Party, a far-right eco-fascist group that advocates, again, this kind of back-to-nature nationalism in opposition to urbanism and to centralized government. Um, both the El Paso and the Christchurch killings additionally claimed inspiration from the massacre in 2011 of 77 people, mostly teenagers, by a far-right radical in Norway. The Norway killer, uh, Andres Breivik, indulged in beliefs uh, of white Nordic peoples as a master race and argued for limits of so-called third world populations. Now, the Texas shooter uh, also posted a manifesto to 8chan, and it additionally circulated widely on the private social media channel, Telegram. Uh, and you see here an, an excerpt from um, this manifesto. And it's worth mentioning Telegram um, because this adds to the dilemma that researchers face um, of access to um, this kind of material and of also of the importance of circulation on private instant messaging channels from WhatsApp to Telegram to Signal uh, and so on. So, I'm, you know, I feel like I perhaps ought to have issued a warning, <laughs> a trigger warning about, about this material. The El Paso killer um, unwittingly brings forth another dimension of the problem um, that not only researchers face, but that we as a society face. And that is that in the drive to situate the threat of national belonging in the immigrant subject, the discourse of eco-nationalism sidesteps all of the economic reasons and conditions that ha have in fact contributed to environmental collapse. Um, as we continue to look to the market to solve public problems, such as the problem of environmental and ecosystem destruction and climate change, we limit the ability to think about long-term and equalizing global solutions to sustainable patterns of living. Um, arguably, you know, if I try to hold in my mind both ideas of this, per, the parameters of nation branding and the parameters of eco-nationalism, I'm really disappointed to see how similar <laughs> these two phenomena are, even though they look very different in some ways, or they, they appear to have emerged from very different 
scenarios. In, in both cases, the economy is really what's driving some of the decision making here. And it's masked in different ways in both nation branding and in eco-nationalism. But we ignore these features uh, to our peril again. Um, we really miss looking at features such as overconsumption, um, marketization, again, and even mediatization. We, we take these as proxies for what is going on, leaving aside the much more embedded and deeper conditions that give rise to uh, na these nationalist phenomena. Um, and I guess maybe even more to the point is that it leaves intact these economic structures that are designed for constant growth. And perhaps that's the, the real bottom line here. Um, I don't have a real like conclusion <laughs> to this talk because um, the more I think about these phenomena and write about them, the more aware I am of how quickly these phenomena are metamorphosing and metastasizing. And this makes me wary of offering any prescriptions or even proper evaluations. I feel like the next phenomenon that comes, it will again be masked in various ways. Um, and it's, I think, up to us as researchers to detect and identify historical patterns and to help people connect the dots between these earlier manifestations and the ones we're seeing now. Perhaps if I will offer any sort of um, thought for us to take forward as scholars of nationalism, I would perhaps just say that the study of nationalism remains urgent, as urgent as it ever was. It needs to be correlated to its mediatization and its marketization to be fully understood in the present and as a legacy of the past. But neither is nationalism reducible to either mediatization or marketization. It requires a constant vigilance and a constant willingness to look for the big picture. The spectrum of nationalism to which Craig Calhoun drew our attention, this tendency to separate phenomena into good nationalism or bad nationalism, we see clearly now that this is a fallacy. Nationalism always contains the entire spectrum. And if we find in our analysis that we are paying too much attention to one or the other side, I think it is our responsibility, again, as, as researchers, to give credence to both ends of the spectrum in our work. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much. And I am really looking forward to discussing some of these ideas with you. I'm going to stop Thank you sharing. very much. Thank you very much, Melissa. We all enjoy listening to your talk. Uh, we've learned a lot from early forms of national branding to today's eco-nationalism phenomena. And now we are opening the virtual floor for any questions or comments. So feel free to turn on your cameras or microphones to ask the questions. You can also put them in the chat box and I can help read them. Yeah, please, if you have any questions. Yes. Yes, uh, Marco, uh, you can go first. If... Hi, Melissa. Just curious, I mean, you wrote the book 10 years ago, so it would be interesting yeah. to, un to understand what what kind of reflection you would have. What What is the, what do you think 10 years after things have changed? You obviously, you elaborate on equal um yeah. nationalism as a possibility of it but do, do, is there anything else that 10 years after you think right things have changed um so this is the first point the second point i mean it's all over saudi arabia the the the, the, the amount of money they are putting into whitewashing themselves so get mm -hmm. rid of the bad nationalism image that they have using sport and other stuff you know that what, what yeah what, what, what do you make of that i mean just yes. as an expert in the field just out of, out of curiosity these two yes. points thank you well yeah so i guess i will answer the second question and maybe that will help me also answer the your first question so yes the case of saudi arabia um has been fascinating to me um we have seen so-called sports washing with saudi arabia we have seen this whitewashing 
um, we have seen this, a lot of the phenomena I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is sort of uh, imagining a homogeneity, um, imagining a very peaceful society, you know, these social imaginaries are very powerful. And um, to the extent that some people in the general, you know, many people in the general public think about nationalism at all, you know, sports is a very powerful place to think about national pride and patriotism. And what we have seen with some of the um, interventions by Saudi Arabia in sports is that um, athletes are have no problems moving over because they, you know, they have to focus on their own careers and their own profits as as uh, athletes. And so they are moving into these forums sanctioned by Saudi Arabia. Um, of course, then we also saw with the most recent um, conference of the parties, the most recent climate summit, not Saudi Arabia, but uh, uh, other uh, Middle Eastern interests um, running that that show as well. You know, you, you see this these kinds of um, cultural penetration. Uh, you see the kinds of political penetration. You see their uh, diplomacy. You see it. You know, all of the features of nation branding that were initially seen as kind of pillars of the brand. Um, Saudi Arabia has done a, a, a marvelous job. You know, it is actually a real success story. If by success we mean they have done a very good job of uh, marketing and mediatizing their narrative of national identity in um, the current context. Um, one thing I didn't mention in my talk, but that's important to remember, is that part of nation branding is about um, subsuming or omitting narratives that do not fit within the brand. I guess I did allude to that when I was speaking of, for instance, in Poland, how older people and older memories were were really um, extracted from, you know, excavated from the way Poland's brand was being developed. So, yeah, something like Saudi Arabia, not, you know, nation branding has not gone away. It's alive and well. Um, it continues to be extremely effective. Um, and I do, you know, to this point I, I was trying to make in, in my talk, we if we pay only attention to, say, the success stories, of course, we miss the ways that other kinds of, um, or other forms of Saudi Arabian um, intervention into global systems uh, is, is taking place. Uh, we know that oil interests are being protected. We know that, um, um, cultural repression is very, very strong. We know that there are all kinds of political issues there. So if I think about, I mean, it's, I, it's very humbling, you know, to, to it's very humbling to get older and to have early um, publications kind of be brought back into the light of day because what really, what I really didn't see when I was working on my dissertation and then that, that first book was how I, I don't know how how the like the Saudi Arabian case um, is is still so effective. I thought that what would happen is that after the financial crisis, we would see people realizing that nation branding was more of a smokescreen. And I was wrong. I was very wrong. <laughs> so it's been very interesting to see how effective it continues to be despite all of the, you know, debunking or analysis, you know, critical analysis that we've subjected brands to and all of the omissions we've brought to people's attention and, you know, it, and, and all of the real economic uh, suffering that so many national populations are enduring that nation branding did not address despite its promises. Um, and it, it still continues to be effective. That is perhaps one of the more humbling aspects of it. Okay, thank you, Melissa, for answering the question. Uh, the next one, I can see Sabina raise the hands. Uh, please go. Hi, Melissa. Lots of questions in my yeah. head. Um, I'll start with one that I'm, I'm probably less, you know, least sure about, really. Um, you know, I, I have this this kind of sense that eco-nationalism is in a way has a slightly different relationship to political divisions than some of the forms in the sense that it's so, you know, appealing to both the left and the right or particular mm -hmm. kinds of, and left, of left and, and right. Because you mentioned different forms and different uses um, you know, of eco-nationalist eco discourses. 
and I was just wondering whether whether you have this sense as well, or, or whether I'm barking at, at the wrong tree. You know, is there something there, uh, and is it perhaps you know in in the context of increased political polarization and greater extremes between you know the political right and left, is it this context partly that helps explain the success of these narratives as well? Um, so that that's my first question. Um, mm -hmm. And the second is, is you know, as I was listening to you, I was reminded of of some research I did recently on um, uh, on on uh, on well, it, it liberalism and 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 media, and um, I keep coming coming across obviously the great replacement theory as well, and within that also eco nationalist discourses and uh, and and these concerns as well. Um, and then there's this particular interesting kind of event that I've been following, which is called, the well, interesting is not the right word, kind of disturbing, um, uh, which is called the Demographic Summit, uh, which is organized in Budapest every couple of years. It's a big promotional thing for, for obviously for Hungary and, and Orban. Uh, yeah. And it attracts, you know, leaders from across the world. It, it's really fascinating, both political leaders. And, and one of the recent topics was sustainability. And their answer to sustainability was um, a family, B nation, mm. and ultimately they didn't call it that, but it was race. So mm. I guess, it, it, you know, my question is, to what extent is it even possible to divorce eco-nationalism from racism, uh, especially in its right-wing manifestations? Yeah. My, my sense is it, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah. Ultimately, deep down, it's it's about, you know, white nationalism, i.e. racism. Yeah. Yeah, that's, so. I mean, that is why this article focused so much on that side of it. It is very hard to imagine, well, I... Let me put it a different way. Um, sorry, that's that's like a, an aside. Let me address the big picture of your your question. Um, thank you, also Sabina. Thanks for helping me think through this. Um, I I am not sure what to think. Like when you mention internationalist discourses, are you thinking of discourses that say we need international solutions to say planetary problems such as climate change, but also you know pandemics and also terrorism and so on is that what you're referring to or are you thinking of a different uh, register? no no it, yeah yeah it could it yeah. could be um so you know it, it's the kinds of discourses that uh, clearly operate both through nationalist and and global discourses if that right. makes sense yeah yeah but but the global solution is is nationalism right right <laughs> exactly yeah so you know from my vantage point here in the united states um obviously um the sense of you know who is an American and what is American identity is hotly contested as it, as it always has been um, and the polarization that we are seeing does not seem to you know it's not helping um, on the other hand I'm I I'm not sure I even know where to put polarization let's say in a sequence of events in other words I wonder sometimes is the media helping us to foster an impression of extreme polarization in order to advance certain political viewpoints and, and vice versa, are, are politicians asserting a certain polarization in order to uh, advance their own particular viewpoints? Like we're well aware that let's say our media have taken more extreme stances to the right and the left um, than perhaps what we previously saw. And we're also well aware that again, I'm speaking about the U.S. context, previously marginalized conservative groups who were not part of, say, federal institutions and other you know, state-led institutions have increasingly moved into the mainstream. So we're more aware of a kind of polarization, but I don't know whether it's the case that we are actually in a situation of greater polarization or whether that polarization was always there. It just didn't look the same. So anyway, that's a kind of a one way of answering your question is to think about how to what extent this Ill illib illiberalism and nativism was always in place and or has long been in place or has manifested in different ways over time rather than um, the way it was presented, you know, I showed that slide of foreign affairs that that was a special issue they put out in 2019, where they're talking about the so-called new nationalism and the rise of this polarization. I, I wonder if that's the wrong narrative. Um, and if, again, that was all those these features were always there. Um, and the solution for some was always to turn inward uh, and reassert borders. It just wasn't as prominent in our public discourses. 
So to me, something like that demographic summit that you mentioned, although I'm not familiar with the summit itself, I can sort of imagine. Um, I'm not I'm not surprised at all to hear that um, keywords like sustainability are being evoked in those environments. And, and indeed, you know, these that group I showed in the video, Progressives for Immigration Reform, they will liberally use the word sustainability um, because sustainability is its own empty container um, that can be filled with political valences and ideologies. And that's very problematic uh, because it means that our words are not sufficient to help us contain the kinds of um, narratives that we want to see move forward and the kinds of policies that we feel need to be put in place. And by we, I guess I mean, you know, those of us on this call who um, I'm guessing are, are <laughs> thinking more on the liberal end of things. Um, it means that we have this kind of uh, constant connotative indeterminacy. And this indeterminacy, you know, what does it mean to say, you know, America is a great country? This, this is shot through with all kinds of different ideological stances. What does it mean to say I'm committed to sustainability? I think um, what, I've se what I've seen when I observe um, environmental movements and or, you know, climate movements and their efforts is that they are constantly walking into traps because they'll put forward this idea, you know, sustainability matters. And then immediately you have a group that opposes their uh, goals saying, yes, we too care about sustainability in the environment and here's how we're going to resolve it. So it, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing almost a kind of um, deliberate um, muddying of the semantic waters that we are swimming in. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, I saw a question in the chat mm -hmm. box. Uh, can you say a little bit more about the mediatization of eco-nationalism? Specifically, I'm interested in learning how media function as a cultural space, while the ostensibly contradictory environmentalist and the capitalist mm -hmm. ideologies merge. If right-wing activists were truly devoted to sa saving the environment, we would expect them to dismiss the capitalist ideology, preaching for mass production or consumption, leading mm -hmm. to the destruction of the environment. That is obviously not the case, as the leaders of contemporary right nationalism are often allegedly successful business people. How mm -hmm. do they rec reconcile the two? Thank you. Well, yeah, sorry, so, Melissa, yeah. sorry if yeah. I step in and sorry, apologies, um, Olivia, as well. I see there are two more questions and we are conscious of the time. Shall uh, we okay. maybe try to collect more uh, questions and then sure. you can talk because otherwise we might go over time. Of Thank course. you. Sorry about that. Thank no you. Problem. Yeah, I can also see Michael and Taeyong uh, raise their, uh, their hands. Uh, Michael, please go first. Um, Thank you. Very, very quickly, this is a more general question about nation branding. Yes. It, it seems to me that, you know, when the phenomena of nation branding first came out all those years ago, it was about the West teaching other parts of the globe how they could promote themselves, even though they weren't quite as good as the West. They had some nice things that they could promote. And perhaps today that's changed a bit. And so if we think about countries like Saudi Arabia, their attempts at sports washing or whatever you want to call it they don't really care that much about what the west thinks and often mm -hmm. it's about um engaging with regional powers in the middle east for example with china with russia it might be about promoting themselves to their own people and i just yeah. wondered if you could reflect on whether you think that there has been a shift away from this idea of nation branding as something that the west advised others to do and that something that others do now, largely unconcerned about what the West thinks about them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and then did you want to ask the third question? And then I'll, I'll answer all three or? Yes, uh, Taeyong, please go. Um, yes, thank you very much for your presentation. And my question, I think is somewhat um, related to what Michael said. Because uh, when it comes to studying or like analyzing nationalism, we often have to think about like how the, those ideologies or discourses matter to its domestic population. So it would be appreciated that if you could give some kind of um, your share your insights on 
how that climate change or any kind of environmental dialogues combined with nationalist sentiments, how that actually mattered to the domestic population. If you could elaborate on that, that would be much appreciated. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. OK, thank you, everyone, for these questions. I really appreciate Again, it's it's so great to have the chance to spend time with you because I'm always asking questions like this in my head, but I don't often get to ask them with other people. So thank you for this. Um, to the first question, then, um, if I understood the question correctly, please correct me if I, I didn't. Um, your question is sort of about this inherent contradiction or paradox where far right eco nationalists say, um, you know, it's it, the, the problem is overpopulation. The problem is overconsumption, you know, and we need to um, conserve resources. And so therefore, um, let us close our borders and let us be more, you know, um, like candide and take care of our own gardens at home. And yet they are often, as you point out, uh, very, you know, six, let's say successful global entrepreneurs um, and business people and other types of economic elites. Uh, who, of course, you know, require this cons constant focus on economic growth and profit making. And I would say that you have actually identified the central paradox. That is the central paradox, is that there's a, there's a fallacy in the argument of eco-nationalists. I mean, we know there's a fallacy in the sense that we, you know, I, I won't go into a long conversation about what immigration does and is for and how it helps the economy and how it um, it's not just a question of uh, moral obligation, but a question of actual um, participation by by migrants in all kinds of positive ways in, in society and, and so on. And not to mention the reasons that migrants have left their homes in the first place, which can have to do with climate change. You know, so there's all kinds of other factors that we could bring in to try to um, untangle this, but we don't even need to because we can look at this central paradox that you've identified and say that it, it really does not make sense. Um, it is a rhetorical set of claims that is being advanced. I think it's questionable whether some of the people who wield these strategic narratives believe in the kind of narrative that they're spinning or whether they actually think that it has an impact on other publics, other audiences, and that's why they use it. And that, I think, is actually a key to the questions of, that both Michael and Tae Young raised, which is about this um, difference between domestic, you know, the home population, say, where the country is being branded, and the external audience. So here I would say, yes, nation branding is always about both. It's always about convincing your citizens at home that you are doing something for them or that you are um, helping the country uh, benefit in some way from the, the international stage, uh, whether that's um, you know reputationally legitimacy, whether that's um, inward you know foreign direct investment, whether that's you know uh, other things. Um, what I see with the case of Saudi Arabia is actually still very much in line with Western dominance. I don't actually see, even though you will see Saudi Arabia and many other countries you know, doing business with other countries that are not in the West. So a non-Western country doing business with another non-Western country, obviously that's, <laughs> they don't need to go through the West in order to um, have capital flows, of course. At the same time, the global policy about say fossil fuels is still very much in the hands of the West. And I do believe that Middle Eastern countries that are fossil fuel reliant, need to demonstrate to the international community, mainly the West, that they are stable, um, that they are that the policies that are put in place will be respected in those countries, uh, that the network, the you know the, not just the capital flows, but also the the raw materials flows will continue to take place unabated. Uh, I do think that is still very much what's at stake here. And I think we see it in the ways that, um, Saudi Arabia or other Middle Eastern countries intervene in um, international diplomatic settings um, and in Western media. I think if, you know, if they were absent entirely from those environments, I perhaps would be tempted to make a different argument, but their prevalence suggests to me that they are actually trying very hard to curry influence in Washington, D.C. and in London and the other, um, other global financial centers where fossil fuels are part of what runs the economy.
Um, one last thing about the domestic and international audiences that, you know, it's so interesting. Every time I have spoken about nation branding, I've had a question about that. Like, how do you, you know, how do you reconcile the two or, you know, how could you possibly convince the domestic population of one thing while con convincing the international population of another? Um, and here I, I can say, you know, this is this was initially the premise of nation branding, that nation branding would join together the two images. In other words, you would have to have the approval of your local population if you're a national leader. You would have to have the approval for the kinds of values and beliefs that you are disseminating abroad. But in fact, I think what has happened instead is more of a boomerang function. Um, and I won't be um, Keck and um, I will, I've forgotten the names of the two other authors who've talked um, not specifically about nation branding, um, but about, thank you, <laughs> thank you, about the boomerang effect. I see this boomerang effect happening in nation branding, where in fact what happens is a country like Saudi Arabia will curry international favor in order to gain domestic favor. It goes the other way around. That in that being recognized by the Americans or the Brits or other Western um, um, centers the elite cosmopolitan global centers is what allows them to claim legitimacy uh, with their domestic population and to legitimize all kinds of decisions that may not actually be good for the local, uh, the domestic national population, but that um, have the kind of um, shiny, you know, golden sheen that comes from being legitimized by others. Um, and when I, I have taught a class um, some years ago now and written some about the notion of reputation, the concept of reputation and the extent to which, you know, reputation is not something that you claim for yourself. It is something that others confer upon you. It's entirely externally uh, developed. You cannot yourself make and maintain a reputation. It's by others. And that has really helped me think through this idea that um, the international legitimacy is key to the domestic legitimacy. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for answering so many questions. Of course, I'm happy to have them. Uh, I think we reached the time. Uh, so let me thank you again, Melissa, for this interesting talk. And thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. And we hope to see you all next time at our future events. For people yes. who want to review the talk, it will be posted on the long website. So thank you again and have a nice day or a nice evening. <laughs> Thank you Thank also. You, Thanks, everyone. Thank um, you. Bye. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Hope to see you again soon. Hope to see you in Australia, not sooner. <laughs> yeah. Same here, Melissa. Let you yeah. know. Bye. Bye. Take care.